Welcome everyone to NEPCON Sourcing Hub webinar. So that's good morning, good afternoon or good evening to you wherever you may be. Uh, in this webinar this morning, we'll be looking at, at the newly launched um, NEPCON Sourcing Hub and also how to use the new risk assessments and tools that are on the hub to help conduct due diligence. People involved in this webinar is myself. My name's Anne Weddell. I'm project manager at NEPCON. We have uh, Christian Sloth, who is our Forest Legality Program Manager. Also, Alexandra Banks, our Senior Forest Legality Specialist. And also on the call, we have Rido Kerner, who is our IT Specialist, helping us with any IT. Please note that this record, uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, we'll record the, the entire thing so we can share it with you and anyone else at, um, afterwards. The agenda this morning is looking at um, welcome and introduction, that's myself now. Then we'll have um, a presentation by Christian Sloth, who will be giving um, a presentation about the Sourcing Hub concept, so that's the background to, to our work. Then moving over to Alexandra Banks, who will be looking at using the Sourcing Hub in due diligence. And that's really looking at the how-to. Then we'll move on at 10.55 to a question and answer session. So we have quite a lot of time to answer your, your questions. And then we'll be closing at 11.30. As I said, the question and answer is an important part of today's webinar. And there are two ways in which you can ask your question. One is by writing your question. And if you do that in the, the chat box, so please write your question in the box meant in the box that's marked. Enter a question for staff, shown in this, the diagram here. You can also ask a question verbally if you like. So there, please click raise your hand. And sorry, this is where it's shown in the picture on the right. This will be you will be put in line and unmuted by the organizer when it's um, passed over to your question. Please bear in mind that we have a large number of participants on today's webinar. So we politely request that you keep your questions short and precise. We'll try to aim at one to two minutes per question. If your question is asked by someone else, please can you lower your hand by clicking that same raised hand icon again. And if we don't get to answer your questions by by 11.30, then please send any unaddressed questions to Alex, and this is her email address here. After the webinar, you will receive an email with all the slides, um, a link to the recording of the webinar, and a summary of all the Q&As. So now I'll hand over to Christian Sloth. Christian, you should now be able to show your screen. Yes, hello. I will. There we go. Hi, yeah, my name is Christian Slot, and I am the Forest Legality Program Manager of NEPCON. I will, in this presentation, talk a little bit about uh, just a brief introduction to NEPCON for those of you who do not know us and I will also give a general background to the issues surrounding why we are working, why we have developed the sourcing hub and what it is we are trying to achieve with doing it. So I will be providing some of the, the background to that. Um, firstly, I would like to say that the work we have done has been conducted in close partnership with FSC. Um, through the FSC uh, control board program and the work FSC has done to develop national uh, risk assessments worldwide. So uh, it had also been done with uh, financial support from the NIDA, the Danish government, the EU LIFE program and the UK government. So very briefly about Christian, NEPCON. So, we sorry are... for interruption. Can you uh, click on this uh, orange uh, arrow in the code to webinar? It's oh, sorry, showing yeah. uh, the panel for others. Yeah. 
Thanks. I'll put it up here. No, it's not working. All right, just briefly about NEPCON. We are an international not-for-profit organization and have worked with sustainable and responsible trade of forest commodities uh, for more than 20 years. We are a mission-based organization, um, so our vision is to a world where human choices ensure a sustainable future, and we are working on that through building co commitment uh, and capacity uh, for uh, uh, mainstreaming sustainability. We have a programmatic focus that that, uh, that focuses on both land conservation or conservation of land and forest. We work directly with land use uh, on the ground. We work with traceability of timber uh, and other commodities such as uh, palm oil, cocoa, other agricultural commodities. And we also work uh, within the area of, of responsible sourcing um, through due diligence approaches. NEPCON is an organization with uh, about 120 full-time staff and we have offices uh, in 19 countries, mainly based in, in Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia, but also in Australia, Vietnam and Malaysia and the US. So we are, have a global presence also through a network of uh, our consultants. So let me get into the to the issues that we're talking about today. Um, we are talking about products and different commodities. I think that we can say that there is a, a trend in, in, in consumers and the industry being more interested in the, the story of the products uh, uh, that they buy uh, and source. But the understanding what that story really is uh, and having access to that information can be difficult. For example, where was the products grown? Where, how was it harvested? Uh, you know, was the harvesters of timber, for example, paid a fair wage? Uh, was forest being converted where, where plantations have been planted? Has there been illegal activities at forest level or in the pro uh, production level of, of products? Uh, is there corruption in the supply chain and so on? So, there's a whole range of different questions that we would like to be able to uh, answer about our the products that we source. So, unfortunately, not all of these stories are, are good ones. Um, so, if we look at both timber, for example, we all know that there has been a lot of uh, discussion around illegal timber, unsustainably harvested timber, but also for other commodities like soy, palm oil, and beef, we all know that there are a lot of concerns about the negative environmental impacts that these commodities can have uh, uh, on the environment and people where they are grown. So, for example, uh, you know, a really good example of this that you know, we all know the story that about one football, uh, one hectare of forest is being converted every second. So that's like two football fields every second of, of, of tropical forest that's being cleared. Uh, so that's a really compelling picture of this story. Let's have a, a little bit of a closer look at some of the, the specific stories. This is about timber. Um, this is the Sar Sarawak Forest Corporation that's inspecting illegally harvested timber in Sarawak. Um, and this is from a short-term uh, lease where timber should have timber harvesting should have been ceased, but obviously has continued illegally. So we know that for uh, illegal logging and illegal harvesting of timber has a range of negative impacts. Um, there is resource destruction uh, of forests. Um, it's unfair competition markets where illegal. Uh, timber is entering often see lower market prices for these timbers therefore having a, a unfair competition uh, on legally harvested products there's obviously loss of government revenues uh, it can be related to social instability uh, and inequality it can be it is often related to organized crime 
and an end to uh, corruption. So illegal and unsustainable timber harvesting is, a, is a, still a serious concern for many countries in the world. It's being estimated that about 20 to 40 percent of global industrial wood production is illegal. Uh, that was a study conducted by um, uh, Interpol a couple of years ago. And the value of the annual trade with illegal harvest uh, products is estimated to be around 30 to 100 billion US dollars per year. In the sourcing hub, we are also looking at other products. So we have risk assessment and information about other commodities like soy, palm oil, and beef. So if we look a little bit on the story of soy, uh, this is a picture of a soy farm in Paraguay. And as you can see, this is pretty in intensive and there's not a lot of the original vegetation left on in these strips. Um, in 2014 alone, it was estimated that about 113 million hectares of land was required in total globally to grow soy. This is the size of the UK and France and Germany combined. So it's very, very significant areas that are being put under soy production. And 75% of the world's soy production ends up as feed for poultry, pigs, cattle, and farm fish. So the consumption of meat obviously have an impact on the demand for, for soy, uh, which then affects the, the area of land that's used for soy production. The next one is uh, uh, beef. We have, many of you have probably heard about what's happening in the Amazon uh, with, with cattle farms. Uh, this is a picture of a, a cattle ranch in, in the Amazon area in Brazil. Uh, where farmers are using fire to clear the land. Uh, it's also known that um, cattle ranching is the main reason for tropical deforestation uh, and it's, uh, it's estimated that it has accounted for about 90% of uh, forest destruction in the Amazon basin uh, and in total have been responsible for clearance of 136 million hectares of rainforest uh, globally. So that's also a very, very significant area. Also, not only about uh, removing timber from the land and putting cows there, but it's also uh, known that uh, the meat and dairy industry is, is one of the main contributors to global uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, and it's estimated that about 50% of global Greenhouse gas emissions uh, are contributed by, by cattle and dairy farming. The last bad story here is about palm oil. And this is a drone footage from an area in Indonesia called West Kalimantan. So we can see land here being cleared and prepared or terraced for planting uh, palm oil. Palm oil has also been uh, responsible for the clearing of a very large area of, of land, uh, mainly in Indonesia and Malaysia, and it's estimated to be around 26 million hectares of rainforest that's been cleared to make way for, for palm oil plantations. And if you've ever been to Malaysia or Indonesia, you have probably seen uh, palm oil plantations if you fly into, for example, Kuala Lumpur, or if you fly into um, to Sabah uh, on Borneo. Palm oil is a, a really widely used commodity and it's, it's found in almost half of the pa packaged products in every grocery store in the US. And that's products like ice cream, cookies, pizza, chocolate uh, and bread. So this was kind of the last of the, like the issues related to these different commodities. The last uh, point here about the challenges we're facing is the complexity of supply chains and that that's true for timber but it's also uh, uh, true for most other uh, types of commodities that have a global market that's being uh, used in the global uh, trade. If you work in the timber business you probably know um, the difficulties of obtaining information 
uh, and really understand the structure of supply chains going beyond the your immediate supplier uh, may be may be difficult so and even if you are working with resp responsible sourcing issues even if you are able to get to to know where the timber was harvested you still face the challenge of understanding the local context for example if you are looking at minimizing your risk of sourcing illegally harvested timber so if you manage to to obtain uh, supply chain transparency and understand where your timber originates from you would still have to understand the local context of laws uh, what's uh, relevant laws and other regulations that has to be met um, just an example of that in uh, Kalimantan and in Indonesia there are more than 19 state and national laws that regulate land tenure alone so uh, understanding that is is it's a bit challenging, so even if you, you know where the, the product is coming from, you will face this complexity of the context. So let's try to uh, get to a bit more of the positive side of the story, at least from our side. Um, when we talk about these, all these negative stories, it's, people often say, well, well, why don't we just stop buying these products, or why don't we just stop buying timber from Indonesia or Malaysia or countries where there may be uh, risks of illegal uh, harvesting. Um, it, it's been shown that, that boycotts doesn't really work. Um, WWF carried out a study into the effects of boycotting palm oil a couple of years back and they found what would happen in the market would be that companies would just have to switch to alter alternatives to palm oil. So they wouldn't actually and, and some of these alternatives would require up to nine times the land that it, it takes to grow palm oil. So that would actually just make the problem worse. So, and similarly, if you boycott a product, it's likely that, you know, timber production companies or palm oil companies, they're not just going to stop and close down uh, in the country where they are producing them, they'll just try to find alternative markets that's not as sensitive to these environmental and legal concerns that we are as we are in for example Europe or, or the US or in Australia so our experience with working with the food and timber industry is that there has to be certain factors present in order to ensure that a positive change can happen um, there has to be a goodwill or there has to be an interest in in this change to happen, of course, um, there has to be a market demand for products uh, that are responsible or, or legal or uh, sustainable. There has to be product availability, of course, the products of the producers must be able to, to meet the demand. And there also has to be political structures that support this change. So, but when you have these, this combination of um, factors, then change can and will happen. And I think a good example from the timber industry is what happened in, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, there was a lot of focus on the on illegal and unsustainable logging, which peaked in 1992 with the Rio Earth Summit. So even though there was all this international recognition of the problem, there was still no binding agreement at that time. And that led NGOs and the industry to join forces and develop the FSC certification system without political uh, uh, action at that time. So when FSC was started in 1993, this was really a revolution within how the timber industry was sourcing and producing uh, timber and other wood products. And it's a, it's a success, uh, it's continuing today. We have now, I think, the latest number I saw was almost 200 million hectares of forest that is FSC certified. Plus we have other certification systems that work with sustainability like PFC and other um, legality verification programs. However, uh, despite the success of cert uh, certification approach uh, of FSC, uh, there was a continued um, concern about illegal logging which have continued in many areas that has not been certified. So 
And as I said before, there was a study by Interpol uh, and UNEP a couple of years ago uh, that estimated that up to 30% of the timber trade uh, was illegally uh, illegal origin. So what we have seen in the timber sector is that this challenge has actually now been met with political and legal response. So we have in the EU, we have the EU timber regulation. In the US, we have the US, the Lacey Act Amendment. And in Australia, we have the Australian Illegal Logging Prohibition Act to regulate timber trade in these markets. So I think this is a really important lesson that we could also use. I think we could use this lesson from the timber industry uh, also to look at these other commodities. And I think we are actually seeing this now, especially in, in, in Europe. Uh, where the EU or the, the European Commission is, is considering if uh, regulation similar to the EU temper regulation should be implemented uh, on other commodities such as palm oil, uh, soy and also uh, beef. So as I said we have seen these success stories um, for, from certification, uh, and there has been a lot of advances in product with certification, with supply chain management systems, and other efforts to incentivize legal and, and environmental compliance. But historically, the focus has been to tackle uh, this, the problems in supply chains, one commodity at the time. What? So, you know, there are con these concerns about palm oil, there's concerns about soy and timber, um, but depending on, of course, if you are if you are a retailer, for example, that sells a lot of different types of products, I think we have to move beyond the focus on single commodities and single certification systems, uh, especially where there is no um, where's, where there is uh, where's a, no availability of uh, enough certified material. So. In NEPCON, we believe that the next generation of responsible sourcing will be a more integrated approach, a more holistic and, and also a risk-based approach. And to do that, to implement a real risk-based approach, uh, you need information. So, and I know that, you know, you need information about um, where the timber comes from, the legality, and all of these issues, and we know that, of course, it can be difficult if you are if you are a buyer of timber or other products. You know, we know that you have other uh, priorities as well, like price, quality, delivery, packaging, logistics, market trends, and so on. So it may be challenging also to understand the complexity of the issues of uh, legality or responsible sourcing. What we have done with a risk-based approach in, in NEPCON is we have developed uh, the sourcing hub and we've done that to make critical information and support tools publicly available. Um, and we do this to try to enable efficient decision-making in supply chains uh, from production through processing, transport and trade. So our experience is that a risk-based approach can be efficient uh, in dealing with these responsible sourcing issues. So what is a risk-based or what do we mean by a risk-based approach? Well, a risk-based ap approach is really a, a system that allows you to, it, to focus efforts where there is most need for attention. So if you identify areas of your supply chain, chain with low risk, you do not have to do as much as you have to do for areas where you identify that there's high risk. This is the approach that we use in the due diligence process, which is here in a very simple format. Basically, uh, we understand the due diligence process within this uh, timber sector or other commodities as these three main steps. So that's basically knowing the supply chain or mapping supply chain, assessing risk, in the supply chain and the source of the material 
and also to treat or manage risks. Again, in order to do the or uh, be efficient and effective in doing this, you have to you need information. For step one, you need information about the structure of your supply chain. You need to know where the material comes from. Uh, you, you need to know who your suppliers are. You need to know the, the trade routes of the, the material. Uh, and you also need some sort of information management si system to, to keep track of it. Uh, for step two, you need uh, to identify uh, potential supply chain risks. And you need to understand this context I mentioned later uh, earlier about the in the country of origin, like legal requirements or other socioeconomic structures that can impact on your sourcing strategy. In, a, in addition to this context-related uh, information, uh, you also need to be able to assess what risks could really occur in your specific supply chain. <clears throat> For step three, uh, we often call it risk mitigation. You need information about what actions you can you can actually take to effectively avoid or manage risks uh, in supply chains. So this may this may include knowing which documents are required um, or legally required, or for example, which authorities um, should be contacted to confirm compliance uh, for a certain issue. So. As you can see, information is really critical and at the heart of what we are doing with the, in the NEP Consulting Hub. So before uh, I uh, let Alex take you further into the NEP Consulting Hub, uh, just very uh, briefly, we have recently published 78 country risk assessments, uh, mainly for timber, but also we have a number for palm oil, for beef and soy. So these are country risk assessments, plus we have developed more than 125 different tools uh, that can help companies to evaluate and manage risk in their supply chains. So that was all for me. Uh, I'll now hand over to Alex to show you more about how the NEP Consulting Hub functions. Thank you, Christian. Alex, now you should be able to uh, show your screen. And Alex, also don't uh, forget to unmute you. <laughs> Oops, you missed my excellent introduction then. Um, thank you, Christian. Thank you, everyone. Hope you can hear me now. Um, as Christian and Annie mentioned, I'm going to be talking in, in some more detail about using the Sourcing Hub as part of a due diligence system. Um, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail, and this is a slightly longer session, about how the, the Sourcing Hub supports comprehensive due diligence. Um, so first of all, you may be asking, is this just another data platform? And there is a lot of data platforms out there at the moment purporting to support um, the industry in understanding supply chains. And yes, this is another data platform, but we believe this one is different. Um, and I hope that by the end of this session, you will have a better understanding of what differentiates this um, sourcing hub from the other sites that are already out there and how um, it can be a complementary tool to the existing ones um, to support a due diligence system. As I mentioned, the focus of this session will be on timber due diligence and in particular timber due diligence in the context of the EUTR. Um, <clears throat> but th there are many elements of the Sourcing Hub which can support due diligence um, under any program or legal requirements. So the Sourcing Hub can support due diligence under the Australian Illegal Logging Prohibition Act um, or the due care requirements of the Lacey Act for timber as well, but also more broadly a due diligence risk-based approach to supply chain um, <clears throat> risk for other commodities, soy, palm oil and beef. So first of all, I wanted to start by talking about the risk assessments themselves, which we um, see as the heart of the hub. They really are the foundation of information that the sourcing hub is built on. Christian mentioned the um, timber legality risk assessments are the majority of the reports 
which um, form the basis of the Sourcing Hub, there are actually 62 national timber legality risk assessments on the NEPCON Sourcing Hub. And a majority of those risk assessments were produced in partnership and collaboration with the Forest Stewardship Council. I just wanted to take a, a quick moment to mention in particular the Forest Stewardship Council's Controlled Wood Program and their centralised national risk assessments. In 2014, NEPCOM was engaged by um, FSC to conduct a number of uh, Controlled Wood Centralised National Risk Assessments or CNRAs as they're colloquially called. Um, like all good timber industry things, these have acronyms for their names. Um, there are five controlled wood categories. The first one is about the risk of sourcing illegally logged timber um, and NEPCON were engaged to conduct evaluations at a national level um, about timber legality. We've subsequently been engaged to conduct a number of further legality assessments and also risk assessments for um, high conservation values, conversion and GMOs. I'm not going to focus on the other controlled wood categories today because they are not published on the NEPCON Sourcing Hub, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to recognise that collaboration with FSC certainly would not have been possible for us to publish this information without our um, work for them. And also to recognise the, the important role that FSC has had in um, encouraging the uptake of a due diligence approach within the timber industry and the Controlled Wood Program is certainly instrumental in that. Um, you can see on the slide here as well that we've had other donors who have provided um, funding to do these national risk assessments, including the EU Life Program and the UK Aid Program. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly also the process for conducting the risk assessments. This is quite a detailed slide and I'm only going to spend a little bit of time on it. But just to say that if you have more questions or you're interested in understanding more about how the risk assessments conducted, please feel free to contact me and we can talk about it in some more detail. Essentially the first step in conducting any risk assessment that we do and um, as I said we've done risk assessments beyond the scope of the FSC program, um, the, the first thing is to develop an assessment framework. So for the FSC um, centralised national risk assessments the framework is dictated by the FSC program um, but there are a number of other frameworks that we use for conducting national risk assessments. The, the framework on the slide here on the left hand side includes the 21 subcategories or indicators which are used within the FSC program and they fall within the five broad areas of applicable legislation included in the EU timber regulation which are timber harvesting activities, legal rights to harvest, taxes and fees, trade and transport and third parties rights. Once we have developed the risk assessment framework um, for the commodity, we then go into the process of conducting the risk assessment. Um, the, the first thing that we do is select the commodity in jurisdiction, we secure funding to do the evaluation and then we then engage an expert in the country um, to prepare the assessment in collaboration with our internal uh, legality specialists. The local expert prepares a draft of the risk assessment and we will then review it and then we conduct expert consultation with select stakeholders to ensure the, the findings are complete and robust. Uh, we then carry out our own internal quality assurance process and then we conduct a stakeholder consultation process and revision process. Depending on the framework, um, the stakeholder consultation processes can be different um, and again if you're interested in more of those details please contact me directly. Uh, the, the risk assessment is then published on the, in this case the NEPCON sourcing hub and then we go into a process of ongoing maintenance and feedback and this is an important point I wanted to reiterate today is that we, we see the risk assessments as living documents and we strongly encourage stakeholders who have any questions or feedback or input to contact us at any time um, and we can update the risk assessment if there is something incorrect um, in there. For each of the categories or subcategories against which we evaluate the country, we conclude either a 
risk is present or, or risk is specified or elevated or risk is low. Um, and then based on the outcomes of those risk findings, we calculate a score for each country and um, this dictates the colour coding in the map. So for example, in a timber legality, risk assessment for Brazil, there are 21 sub-indicators um, and the, each indicator that is found to be low risk is allocated a point and so there were eight indicators in the Brazilian assessment found to be low risk and 19 indicators overall which were found to be applicable. So there are actually two areas of law which were not applicable to the Brazilian context um, which resulted in a score of 42 for Brazil. Um, I just wanted to mention also about some of the different risk assessment frameworks that we use. So um, at the top there is the FSC controlled wood system. I mentioned the tim timber legality assessments as the first category there and there are five controlled wood categories in total. <clears throat> NAPCON has done work with FSC also on conducting risk assessments against category three which is about HCVs, category four which is conversion and category five which is GMOs. NEPCON has also done a number of risk assessments under the state Sustainable Biomass Program. We've developed our own risk assessment framework for corporate social responsibility risk, which is what we use to conduct the evaluations for palm oil, soy and beef, um, which have been published on the Sourcing Hub. And we've also done a number of risk assessments under the Sustainable Agriculture Network Framework. <clears throat> What you can see here and the kind of purpose of this slide is that there is a lot of overlap and um, synergies between the different schemes and this is certainly something that NEPCON is interested in looking into further um, where, where the schemes do overlap. <clears throat> I also thought it would be interesting to mention some of the data sources for risk assessments because we're often asked about this um, and I guess the fundamental message here is that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, the context in the country can be very different and different sources of information are available. Um, <clears throat> So we do conduct stakeholder consultation which takes different forms depending on the risk assessment and the country. We seek the input of various experts. We look at published um, justice and tribunal records, also records of um, any infringement notices or activities of enforcement by governments. Um, we look at national statistical reports. For example, many countries publish reports about health and safety um, incidents within the country. Uh, we look at government reports on compliance. Many countries also publish reports about various, various compliance indicators within the forestry sector. We look at um, also international publications, for example, Transparency International's Corruption Perception Inde Index, reports from Inter Interpol, um, the Forest Legality Alliance. The, there are many examples here that we use. Um, we also look at public summaries of certification audits and we include field experience and reports um, in, in the sources, both ours and others. And we're always looking for and trying to incorporate further sources of information. Uh, so that was just a brief introduction to the process of developing the risk assessments and um, I will take you into the sourcing hub towards the end of the presentation and show you in a little bit more detail <clears throat> where you can find the risk assessments but now I just wanted to take you through the steps of a due diligence system and illustrate how the sourcing hub can support a robust due diligence system. So you saw this slide in pr Christian's presentation, the, the three fundamental steps of a due diligence system, knowing a supply chain, evaluating risk and treating risk. And we often talk about due diligence as actually being a four-step process because this first step, um, commitment to legal sourcing or responsible sourcing, definition of the scope of a due diligence system and establishment of systems is also very important. Um, the information gathering, risk assessment and risk mitigation are the same as the previous slide there. These four, four steps represent the requirements um, set out in the EUTR for timber operators. Um, so steps two, three and four are all included in article six of the EUTR and then the commitment, the scope and the systems is article um, two, I believe, off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> see the two or four, I can get back to you on that. 
but essentially these are the four steps um, of a due diligence system as required by the EU timber regulation. So <clears throat> first of all, in relation to the commitment scope and system, um, the, the sourcing hub contains extensive information about how to set up a due diligence system or what we usually call within NEPCON a DDS, again an acronym. Um, so we have published a full DDS on our website within the sourcing hub and it includes several templates that can be used to ensure that the system um, are developed and implemented effectively in accordance with the EUTR. So the EUTR not only requires that timber operators have um, a system in place but that they also maintain and evaluate the effectiveness of that system and um, the NEPCON due diligence system um, meets those requirements. So you can download all of the tools and templates you need to set up a due diligence system within your business on the Sourcing Hub and I'll show you, um, it's actually within this page here, what is due diligence which can be found um, at the far left hand side there, what that's called, I've recently found out a hamburger menu. Um, you can find it in there but I'll show you again at the end when we go and visit the website. So this is what the, the page looks like. You can download the full system there and it's netcon.org forward slash sourcing hub info what is due diligence. Um, and if you have any specific questions about any of the tools, feel free to contact me. The, the next step uh, is about information gathering and this is the first um, part of the due diligence system implementation and it's a very important um, element. As Christian mentioned in the previous session, information is key to understanding a supply chain and, and you really can't do due diligence on a supply chain unless you have sufficient information about that supply chain. The sourcing hub um, includes a lot of information to assist in the process of um, understanding your supply chain and in, in general terms in, in section 61A of the EUTR it requires that you have certain information about your supply chain and that you record that information. Um, <clears throat> we, we have high level information including the risk score, um, general information about the country and the commodity but then we also have tools which um, specifically assist in recording supply chain information, requesting missing supply chain information from suppliers and also mapping supply chains. <clears throat> So this is what a, a timber risk profile looks like on the sourcing hub and um, this is where you'll find all of the information about the different countries for which we've evaluated <coughs> the risks. So you can see here at the top of the page is the different commodities. So timber is in the dark green there and that's the selected commodity. We also have beef, soy and palm oil um, and when you click on that icon at the top it will take you to a map which shows you <coughs> all the countries where we've done a risk assessment. When you click on the country that you're interested in it will take you to this page, the timber risk profile. At the very top of the page is the toolbox which are the downloadable tools um, available for that country. The first of which is the legality risk assessment so that's the, the full report there. We also have a number of other <clears throat> uh, tools available. So the first one is the risk assessment, the second is a list of applicable legislation, the third is a risk mitigation guide and the fourth is a document guide and I'll go into a bit more detail about each of those later on. Um, you'll also see at the top of the page this barometer which displays the risk score for each country. So as I mentioned the risk score is calculated based on the number of sub-indicators within the national risk assessment which were found to be low. So the more low indicators the higher the score and then there are a number of countries where the score is 100 which means that no indicators were found to have a specified risk um, and there are a few countries where the risk is zero which means that all indicators are um, found to be to have a specified risk. That's not to say that um, all the timber in that country is illegal, it's just to say that there is a higher risk that timber coming from that country may have um, been subjected to illegal activities and, and increased t uh, risk mitigation activities should be carried out for that supply chain. <clears throat> On the country page you'll also find general information about the, 
<clears throat> the, the country. So you can see here we've included the Corruption Perception Index, information on any bans and restrictions which are relevant to that commodity. Oddity. Um, information on armed conflict and we specifically included this because it's a it's included in the EUTR as a relevant risk indicator. So this is as I said here the country page for China. You can see that um, in 2016 the CPI or Corruption Perception Index in China was 40 out of 100. There is a um, moratorium on commercial harvesting from state-owned natural forests in China and this was put in place in 2016 and extended to all natural forests at the beginning of this year. And then by the end of 2017 or this year there, there will be no logging in natural forests allowed. Um, forest maintenance is allowed um, from time to time. <clears throat> so that's relevant to anyone buying t Chinese timber um, now and in the future because there is no logging permitted in natural forests. Um, there is an unchanging conflict status in China because of territorial disputes in the sea um, and there's some sectarian conflict and we've used two sources there for the armed conflict, the global conflict trap car and the um, conflict data program. And those underlined areas are both hyperlinks to those sources of information. We've also included any listed CITES species. So you can see for China here, there's one um, <coughs> CITES Appendix 2 listed species, um, which is relevant to anyone buying timber from China. So as you scroll down the page, um, the, the country risk profile, there are three tabs. The first tab is about information gathering and these three tabs were designed to specifically mimic or um, reflect the due diligence steps. So the first one is about information gathering. We first included a description of source types in the country. So the different source types or a source type is um, the different areas or um, types of timber that are available in that country and they can be either um, <clears throat> geographically dispersed or they can be by the type of forest, it depends on the country. So in China we've included three source types, either plantations, natural forests or bamboo forests and um, we've included some information to describe the different sources there. We believe source types are really relevant um, to information gathering and also to understanding your supply chain because risk is often quite distinguished between the different sources of timber. So where natural forests can be considered high risk, um, plantations may be considered low risk and it depends on the country. Um, you'll also see in the information gathering tab for many countries an overview of the key documents which are required um, at the forest level um, related to trade and transport and also related to export and customs. So you can see here for China at the forest level um, a business registration certificate is required, a forest tenure certificate, a harvesting permit, etc. Um, you can also download the full document guide for China to find out more information. So um, if you go back up to the top of the page, you can click on the document guide and download that. And the document guide includes lots of information about the different documents which are required for a legal timber supply chain in China. And it also includes um, annotated examples of the different documents to help you identify <coughs> uh, whether or not the, the document is legitimate and um, we also have a, a article that was recently published by NEP NEPCON about how to identify fake documents. So there's lots of information on the sourcing hub and on the NEPCON website to help um, understand how documents can form part of a due diligence system. So the next step in a due diligence process is about assessing risk. And this is both about identifying whether the risk is actually present in your supply chain and assessing how severe that risk is. So it's about both identifying the risk and specifying what the risk actually is in your supply chain. And this can often be one of the most difficult parts of a due diligence system and something that we have spent a lot of time internally un uh, working to understand and working to um, explain in a clear way through our national risk assessments. So in the previous step, the information gathering step, um, you have secured the information about your supply chains, you understand what you're buying and where you're buying it from. You may have a number of documents um, which 
indicate the legality of, of your supply chain and now you can assess the risks associated with those products with the help of the sourcing hub. So if you click on tab 2, which is the risk assessment tab, you will find a summary of the risks identified at the country level and we've divided these into the five areas of law relevant to the EUTR. <clears throat> So you can see we're continuing with the example for China here. Um, risks have been identified in the National Risk Assessment for China in relation to the legal rights to harvest, in relation to taxes and fees, uh, timber harvesting activities, trade and transport, and then also about traceability. Um, these first four are all specifically referenced in the EUTR. What's missing here is third parties' rights, so there were no risks identified in relation to third parties' rights in China. Um, and just to give you an idea, the, the legal rights to harvest, they're some of the examples of the risks that we specified in, in the National Risk Assessment were a risk of a lack of registration and tenure certificates, um, but that applies only to collective forest plantations. Uh, we identified a risk of conflicts in relation to land rent, again only, collect, only applicable to collective forest plantations. We found a risk of a lack of management plans, which is a legal requirement, and then a failure to meet the requirements for drafting management plans where they were in place. Um, that only applied to state-owned forests. Um, we also identified a risk of harvesting without permits and an un unlawful issuing of harvesting permits. So for those first three risks there, you can see that um, knowing your supply chain, understanding the source type of the timber that you're purchasing is really important to be able to assess risk because you need to know whether or not the timber has come from a plantation, um, whether that was a collective forest plantation and whether or not the, um, the forest is comes under the remit of a state-owned forest management enterprise because if it does, the risks differ um, and, that, and that goes for all of the other risks identified in the report. <coughs> what you can also see with some of these risks is that the, the, the requirements are around documentation. So if the requirement is to have a harvesting permit prior to harvesting, um, a, a copy of that harvesting permit which does apply to the supply chain is a strong indication that that risk is not present in the supply chain. So what this process of identifying and specifying risks to this level of detail has enabled us to do is to provide clear advice about how to treat risks in supply chains and I'll come to that in a moment. I just wanted to show you in a little bit more detail how the report sets out these, this risk analysis and, and in essence the timber legality risk assessments, the long reports are very detailed and we understand that people don't have time to read the, the, full, um, <clears throat> the full lengthy document, I've been told. <laughs> and what we're trying to do with this, this country page is to summarise the really important information. But I'll just show you briefly that for each of the um, countries, the, the first substantive section is a, an overview of the the legality risks, so you can see there there's an explanation of the risk score um, about what some of the risks are, the, the timber source types, and this section is duplicated in every country report, so we, we start every report in this way. We also have a risk matrix which basically includes the 21 indicators which you can see in that middle um, column there, starting with land tenure and management rights and finishing with <coughs> legislation requiring due diligence or due care procedures. And then we've listed on the far right there the different source types and whether or not the finding was low or specified for each of those source types. For each of those 21 indicators we go through the same process of analysis. First we identify the applicable laws and regulations that are relevant to that particular indicator, so in this case land tenure and management rights. Um, we then identify the legal authority, so in this case it's the State Forestry Administration, the State Administrator of Taxation, etc. Um, we identify the legally required documents or records, um, so you can see here there, there's a number of different documents which are required in China for land tenure and management rights. We include all of the sources of information that we've used in this analysis, and I did, actually didn't include them all here because there were too many of them. 
um, but then we go on to the risk determination. So this is really the substantive analysis. First of all, we provide an explanation of what the legal requirements are for that indicator. Um, we then describe the risks and then we come to what is here, which is the risk um, conclusion. So based on the available information, this category is being assessed as low, but but because the information um, provides some, inf uh, some indication of risk in some provinces, we've um, found specified risks in commercial plantations in certain provinces. And then the last um, thing that we do for each indicator is to identify what we call control measures and verifiers, which are basically risk mitigation recommendations. Um, in addition to the risk assessments and the country pages, there are a number of the generic tools um, or the due diligence tools which are available that can support um, a risk assessment. So uh, Annex 2 of the due diligence guidelines, for example, um, introduces the risk identification process. We have a risk identification checklist, supply management form, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go through them all. Um, we'll share these slides, but this is just to give you an idea of the different tools that are available um, on the sourcing hub to support um, the process of risk assessment, which can be challenging. <clears throat> The, the final step of a due diligence process is risk mitigation. Um, <clears throat> and again, the, the level of detail of analysis that we've undertaken in, in the national risk assessments has enabled us to really uh, work very hard on trying to give concrete and clear advice about how to mitigate risks in supply chains where they've been identified because we see this as the most challenging area in um, a due diligence system. So if you click on tab three of the country page, it will take you to the risk mitigation section. Um, every country page includes uh, general advice on how to mitigate risks for that country and that commodity. So um, you can see the beginnings of that here for China. You can download the risk mitigation guide and document guide. Um, but then we also have six recommended actions to mitigate the risks for China. The first is to fully map the supply chain. The second is to obtain and verify documents. The third is to consult with stakeholders. Fourth is to um, carry out field verification. Fifth is to conduct timber testing. And the sixth is to avoid certain types of products. And you can see all of that detail on, on the Chinese country page. You can also download for some countries a full risk mitigation guide, which is a detailed document um, which sets out the different risks, um, where they apply, and what the risk mitigation recommendations are. So for the risk in terms of custom regulations of miss or underreporting on custom dec declarations, uh, we advise that um, you check all the information on the import-export documentation um, and verify that the information corresponds with the material uh, received. And you can verify compliance via the Customs Declaration Registration Approval Certificate and the Phytosanitary Certificate. So we've tried to be quite specific there about uh, what to do about each risk. Um, and I actually chose this customs regulations one because it fits on one page. It's quite short. Some of the others are a bit longer about how to mitigate different risks, which are a bit more complex. So the idea of the sourcing hub is that it is everything you need to conduct thorough due diligence in one place. And um, we hope that we've set it out in a way that is logical in that you can um, follow the steps one, two, three of your due diligence system and find the information that you need to conduct due diligence. Um, to give you a little bit more information about what's actually available on the hub at the moment, for um, three countries, China, for timber, sorry, um, for three countries, China, Honduras, and Liberia, we have a full suite of tools available. So in addition to the country page and risk assessment, which is available for all countries, we have a risk mitigation guide, um, which is a detailed um, overview of how to mitigate all of the risks identified in those countries, a, a checklist of documents, which includes um, sample doc documents and a list of applicable legislation. For Ghana and DRC, we have the country page risk assessment, risk mitigation guide and document checklist. And for the other 57 countries, and I actually listed them all here, but the list was too long, so I took it out. Uh, we have the country page, which is the summary of the risk assessment, um, and also the full risk assessment itself. 
Um, <clears throat> for beef, we have um, risk assessments and country pages for Argentina and Brazil. Um, we also have for both countries the risk mitigation guide and um, a supplier evaluation checklist, which is a tool that companies can use um, when they're trying to identify risks in their beef supply chains from Argentina and Brazil. Uh, we have the same four tools available for soy for Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Bolivia and China. <coughs> Oops, sorry. And um, for palm oil, we have tools available for um, Malaysia and Indonesia and Ghana. And we've done sub-national assessments for Malaysia and Indonesia because the risks are quite differentiated between those um, different jurisdictions. So just in summary, there are 78 national risk assessments and country pages across timber, palm oil, beef and soy and more than 125 guidance documents and tools to help you um, evaluate and manage supply chain risks. The idea is that you <clears throat> go in, into the website and choose your commodity, access the country page and select the country that you're interested in, look at the detailed risk data and then explore the tools and then hopefully technology will be my friend right now. I'm going to go onto the website. Please interrupt me right off, this is not working. Maybe I've just been talking this whole time, hopefully not. Uh, so this is the landing page of the NEPCON sourcing hub and it, it's going to be a little slow now while I do this through the webinar so I'm, I'm going to go quite quickly through this into not too much detail. Um, this is the landing page. You got come in and select which commodity you're interested in. So if we look at um, timber first, um, this shows you the map of all of the countries which we have done national risk assessments for timber for. You can see that they are colour-coded according to the level of risk um, in accordance with our findings in the report. So if we look at um, the Liberia country page, for example, um, and click on the country, it will take you to the country page. You can see here the different tools which can be downloaded. First is the risk assessment. Um, <clears throat> this is quite a long report, so it will take a moment to download. But this is the full assessment. You can download it um, if you'd like some detailed reading. Um, as I said, we have all of the different indicators and the analysis in this report. Um, you can also download the full list of applicable legislation, the risk mitigation guide and the document guide. Um, here's that information I mentioned about the Corruption Perception Index and the other relevant areas for the EUTR. And then the three tabs covering the three areas of due diligence. Um, for Liberia, we have five different source types depending, um, these are actually dependent on the different types of permit. And then um, the risk assessment tab, we have found risk in all five areas. And um, there's some particular risk species here uh, from Liberia. And then in the risk mitigation tab, you can download the supply chain mapping tool. Um, there is some general advice here about mitigating risks for Liberia. You can see that they are uh, documents and consultation with stakeholders and on-site verification, avoiding certain types of timber um, or practices in the supply chain and conducting timber testing. You can also download the full risk mitigation guide um, in that toolbox. There's a lot of information in here if you're buying timber from Liberia about how to mitigate all of the different risks. Um, just to give you a quick overview, you can go in here and look at the different areas of risk. So in relation to legal rights and har to harvest, these are the different risks in the left-hand column and then the advice on how to control those risks in the right-hand column there. You'll also find so similar information for the other commodities. So looking at the beef map, it's not quite so colourful because we've only done two countries, but the production from Brazil and Argentina is about 45% of the global production of beef. Um, it's about the same for the countries we've done for soy. So you can see the different areas that we've looked at for soy there. And then for palm oil, we've in looking at just three countries for palm oil, we've actually covered <clears throat> about 85% of the trade. So um, 
while the maps aren't as colourful and nice looking, they do cover quite a lot of the trade. I also just wanted to quickly show you these different um, areas here that you can find out more information about the sourcing hub in this first tab. Um, <clears throat> the first here, you can have a look at um, our disclaimers if you <laughs> want to read them. You can find out more about how we score the different countries here. Um, the risk assessment methodology, we have lots of details about how we've done the risk assessments in this section um, and also some more information about the different source types. Um, what do we mean by source type? How do we identify the source types? Um, you can find all of the different tools um, in this tools area here. So this is every tool that's available um, on the Sourcing Hub. You can find out information about what the EUTR is, what due diligence is, and this what is due diligence is where you'll find all of the due diligence tools <coughs> and also some general information about illegal logging there. <coughs> what you'll also see on the bottom of every page on the website is um, the information about the scoring methodology, an opportunity to provide feedback and we really encourage and hope for feedback. When you provide feedback you can actually provide us with a specific URL. So if you have information about Liberia or China or Ghana or any other country, you can um, give us the URL of that page and give your information there and we'll <clears throat> be more than happy to hear from you and to talk to you about your feedback. And you can also sign up for updates on the Sourcing Hub uh, using this link here. Um, okay, worked quite well, which is good. Um, and then just to finish off, as Christian mentioned, um, this work could not have been done without our partnership with the Forest Stewardship Council and all the work that we've done for them on the Controlled Wood Centralised National Risk Assessments. And we've had support from a number of donors, um, including DANIDA, which is the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the EU Life Program and the UK Aid Program. Um, I'm going to finish there and we'll go back to Annie now who's going to convene the question and answer session. Thank you for listening. That's great. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so maybe just a reminder of how to ask a question. So either if you could type your question in the, the chat or um, if you can raise your hand, I'm just trying to go back a side, there we go. So you can write your question in the box marked enter a question for staff or if you want to ask your question verbally, if you click raise your hand, that button, and then we, we can unmute you so you can speak. So I'm just going to check now to see if anyone's written any questions or have raised their hand. And it looks like James Hewitt, do you have a question? It's come up with a question mark. So. Yeah, and you can actually see this in the question uh, panel in your computer. You can uh, see the question fully. Okay. Bear with me just one moment. Okay, I'm not sure who this question has come from, but it is, is your sourcing hub free to use or is there a fee applied to have access to the information? I, I can take that one. That's yeah. probably a very good thing that we should have mentioned right at the beginning is that the sourcing hub is completely free and open source. Everything that's available on the sourcing hub is free to download and we don't have any paywalls. Um, so yes, it is free. Uh, I think one more thing to mention is that we are working on developing a you know, database where all the information will be available through a, you know, access through directly into the database so people who are interested in extracting the whole uh, risk assessments or parts of them can do that through an API. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
I think I can see James's question now. And unfortunately, it's coming up in a really small window, so you'll bear with me whilst I read it out. Um, Indonesia's SVLK Tim Legality Verification Scheme has been endorsed by the EC and other stakeholders. Question 1A, does the SVLK assess the well-known fundamental illegalities and, and malpractice which help drive deforestation and proceed the allocation of concessions. Uh, those illegalities are particularly salient in the context of commodities grown on or mined from deforested land and of course climate change. And then question 1b, do you, ha do you agree that Indonesian flag tea licenses sets a precedent which makes it much harder to address those illegalities, deforestation and climate change and excessive consumption? So, Alex, I don't know whether you want me to read question the first part of the question again. Um, well, I maybe I'll just sort of answer generally, and then Christian, you could also answer. Um, just to say that you'll you'll see on the sourcing hub when you click on Indonesia, so the Indonesia is coloured blue, so it's not at, we've not actually provided a risk assessment for Indonesia, we've not conducted a comprehensive analysis of the SVLK system um, as part of the, the timber legality risk assessment for Indonesia. We had actually previously done one but then when the system was endorsed by the European Commission um, because the information we're providing is in the context of the EUTR, uh, companies in Europe no longer have to do due diligence on Indonesian timber. The, the question you asked James about whether or not the flagged license addresses the problems of the the forestry sector in Indonesia is a very valid question, but it's not one that um, I, I am in a position to answer in the context of this this webinar. Um, simply because it's it, it's not our role in in publishing our information on in Indonesia to make that level of judgment. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just to, you know, I mean, I guess you could make a risk assessment of the the risk, but then you would also have to go out and evaluate the whole functioning of the SVLK system and the flag licensing scheme, and that has not been part of what we're doing here. Um, so it's not really been possible to make any make that assessment, and it's not really been within the scope of, of work that we have done. But yeah, it's an interesting question. But uh, yeah, as <laughs> maybe we said, can have that discussion with you <laughs> one day. Um, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, next. The next, one? next question is: Is the source? Oh no, I've answered that. <laughs> uh, a comment from Stephen Mitchell. Excellent tools. Well done. Thank you, Stephen. Can Thanks, I suggest? Steve. You really appreciate. <laughs> Thank you. Can I suggest you explain how these timber risk assessment guides fit in with the FSC NRAs and the Australian country specific guidelines? Yeah, sure. I can, again, I, maybe I'll start, Christian, and you can add anything that I sort of forget. <clears throat> so first of all, the Australian country specific guidelines are specifically provided for in the illegal logging prohibition regulation. So um, those are documents which are prepared by the Government of Australia and the Government of uh, another country and they are prepared and endorsed by both countries as a, a means for importers in Australia to identify legal timber from that country. Um, <clears throat> the, the question about the FSC national risk assessment process and the, the controlled wood centralised national risk assessment process is a good one. And um, it's, as, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, the, a number of the risk assessments that we have prepared uh, were done as part of the FSC national risk assessment or centralised national risk assessment process. Essentially when we went into the, the contract with FSC, we we believed at the time and we still believe very strongly that the potential use of the centralised national risk assessments 
extends beyond the scope of the controlled wood program and, and we think that information is really useful to many different um, players in the timber industry, not just those working within controlled wood. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we were making that information available to people outside the FSC system. And um, we will continue to work closely with FSC um, on finalising a number of the centralised national risk assessment processes which are still underway um, and ensuring our risk assessments are up to date as well. The, the NRAs themselves, not to get into too much detail about the nuances of the FSC system because it is slightly complicated but there are in some countries centralised national risk assessments and national risk assessments and ultimately the national risk assessments which are prepared by the national partners in different countries will supersede the centralised national risk assessment so there will only be the national risk assessment um, and that, that process is underway in some countries. So essentially the the they are three, our sourcing hub, the FSC risk assessments and the um, country specific guidelines are three sources of information for people buying timber trying to understand their supply chains and we, we are just trying to publish this information and make it as user friendly and as available as we can through the sourcing hub. Great. Did you want to add anything? Now Stephen is saying great, thanks Alex. Sweet, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, a question from Annette Hillig. Are you cooperating with the book chain project of Carnstone? Oh, um, the the short answer is no, I haven't heard that, but I'd be interested to hear more. Maybe um, you could email me about that if you have some more information. Yeah, great. Stone project, right? Book chain project. Book chain. Yeah. Or Carnstone. Did we answer all the questions of James? I thought there was one more. Did we address all of them? The the second one about the second one was about um, FT licenses and whether that sets a precedent, yeah. which makes it harder to address the illegalities, deforestation, and climate change. Yep, did we? I don't think we answered that. Really. No. Well, that was more my general comment about I don't, I don't know that I can answer that question. <laughs> Basically, oh, it's not within the yeah, it's not really within the scope of this process to look it at could those be quite issues. A long answer, couldn't it? it could be a very long answer. It would be a question I'd love to be able to answer though, but I I can't today. <laughs> Okay, um, Andrea Muller asks, do you have own field inspectors if NEPCON is acting as EUTR monitoring organisation? Um, um, we, we are acting as a, sorry. No, you yeah, we are acting as a, yeah, we are acting as a uh, monitoring organisation um, on kind of a different uh, part of NEPCON is is working with assurance services and we are recognized as an EU monitoring organization. It's not been part of this project directly. I mean, this project is a publicly funded project where we are working to to support the implementation of the EU timber regulations through the, making this information available. Um, we do have uh, auditors, we call them, that works with the, with the EU TR monitoring and verification of of implementation of due diligence systems and risk assessment processes. Fantastic. I don't know if the question if the question related to uh, to having people on the ground in each of the countries we have done risk assessments in, but um, maybe Alex, you can talk a little bit about. That. Yeah, Andrea is saying yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So. I guess, yeah, as Christian said, that they're two sort of separate roles. And as a monitoring organisation, we are, we are authorised to assist operators in the EU to set up a due diligence system and to implement that system. So that's a very EU-based um, role. So our, our, that monitoring organisation 
role applies to a relationship with importers in the EU, generally speaking. In the preparation of the national risk assessments, we have in some countries included specific field data where it is available. Um, and in, I would say, I don't have the exact figure off the top of my head, but I would say 90% of countries, we've also engaged local experts, often with field experience, to prepare the report. But it's, it's not a, a a process whereby we go out and conduct field inspections to prepare the report. We use publicly available data about field inspections as a, a data input into the findings. Does that answer the question? Mm, yeah, thank you. That's the response, I'm, I'm guessing, yes. <laughs> Um, I can see three questions that relate to how often we update, um, so the maintenance of the information mm -hmm. and also the, the date of publishing. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you want to say a bit about that. Uh, yeah, sure. So this the question about maintenance is a really valid one and it's something that we um, have always been and will always be aware of, the necessity to keep these updated. Essentially, um, the the FSC uh, risk assessments, there is an FSC process for updating their national and centralised national risk assessments, which is on a five-year cycle. Um, but we hope to maintain the data and update it more frequently than that where we can, um, depending on funding. But of course, to maintain the relevance of this website, the data needs to be updated. What we want to do is um, use also a risk-based approach to updating. So where there are more risks in a country, we will seek to update the risk assessments more frequently. Um, <clears throat> and where there are fewer risks or uh, higher levels of um, governance or lower levels of perceived corruption, we think the necessity to update is less frequent, but um, that's a process that we're going through now to identify how and when to do that exactly. Um, <clears throat> and then the question about data publication. So most of the risk assessments, when you download them, you will notice that they're dated August 2017. Um, that is the date that NEPCOM published them for the first time. But we've actually been developing them all over the last three and a half years. So some of them were actually drafted earlier than that. We just have only published them ourselves before now. Um, some of them are dated May 2017, which are the risk assessments we published for the soft launch of the Sourcing Hub back in June. Some of you may have also seen that when that happened. Um, but yeah, it's either May or August is the current publication date. Okay, thanks Alex. I see now three questions with regards to documents. So the first one is, um, one of the most important points is to verify, sorry, that's just disappeared from my view. Okay, I'll start again. One of the most important points is to verify the documents. Do you have any direct access to the web page of the authority in charge in the origin, official publicity of documents or mailing list of res responsibilities? Responsible, I guess, responsible people in the origin. Uh, yeah, a great question. And yes, we do where it's available. So um, we where we can link it directly within the country page um, in that first tab about information gathering. If we have a list of documents in there, if there is a public web page where that document can be verified, we have included that specifically. I'm trying to think of an example of so my actually. Um, is is it a bad idea for me to show you? I can show you that specifically. But if well, you look for <laughs> maybe not. But if you look, for example, at the country page for beef from Brazil, um, you'll notice there's a lot of links to different ways to verify documents in that page. Same for timber from Brazil. Um, so yes, where that information is available, we have included it and. Um, I certainly recognise that verification of documents is a really, really important step and something that can be quite difficult um, when you're sitting in an office in Europe to understand all of the different documents that you're receiving from around the world um, or Australia or the US or wherever it is that you're doing your due diligence from. <clears throat> Great. 
Okay, next question with regards to documents. Number one, for documents required in each country, do you mention the real name used locally of the document? And they give an example, so for a business license, it, it might mean nothing in some countries, um, and the real name, oh, I cannot pronounce that, that's French. <laughs> but it's basically, are we using the local name for the document? Do we give that? Yes, again, we do wherever we can. Um, and this is something that as we've gone along in the process of doing risk assessments, we've gotten much better at. So um, we the, the risk assessments that have been prepared much more recently, we always include the, the name in the local language. So again, um, using the example from, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this because I'll really butcher it, but um, the Certificate of Registration in Brazil for the Rural Real Estate, the acronym is CCIR, and we've included there on the country page the the name in Spanish. And um, yeah, this is definitely in response to feedback that we got on earlier iterations of the risk assessments that, you know, we need to have the, the local names in the local language, we need to have links where we can. Um, so you may notice a little bit of inconsistency across the website that some countries we have that for them and some we don't, um, but we're certainly trying to get get the information in the local language. So um, all of the uh, Congo Basin, West African countries have also included them in French, where the, it's a French-speaking country f for the same reason. So you'll you'll see it a lot more frequently in the South, Central and South American countries and the um, Congo Basin countries, and that's in large part because the original reports were prepared in the local language, so we had all of the information in the local language already. Okay, thank you. Then for Next question, for China, the Sourcing Hub recommends to collect, for example, work permit for special occupations from forest level. Do you seriously think that European importers will be able to collect so many different legality proving documents? Uh, that's a good question, but it's not really about what I think necessarily, it's about what the EUTR says. And the EUTR says that you need to have documentation to indicate compliance of the timber with the legal requirements in force in the country. And um, yeah, what, what we've found with China is that there is there is a risk associated with work permits for different types of employment and um, that obtaining a copy of the work permit is a way to mitigate that risk. I, I'm, I'm not going to try to say that it's not always an easy process because it's certainly not. Um, sometimes there are lots of documents to collect but uh, what we have, have tried to do and what we've done in, in developing the Sourcing Hub for Timber in particular is to read the requirements of the EUTR to look at the way that the EUTR is being interpreted and implemented by the competent authorities in various countries in Europe and to respond to that need. Um, Okay, um, I think we've got time for maybe one last question. Um, it's, can existing guidance or resources in the Sourcing Hub support risk assessments for other sectors like agriculture? What a great question. The short answer is yes, we hope it can. Um, and what you will notice on the Sourcing Hub is we, you know, we do have some information for beef, for soy, for palm oil, um, and what we have now done for a number of countries is do risk assessments across different commodities. So for Indonesia, we've done timber risk assessments, we've done palm oil risk assessments, for Brazil, we've done soy risk assessments, beef risk assessments and timber risk assessments. And, and what we see now, having finished all of that work, is that there are lots of similarities across both the legal requirements and also the risks. Um, so what we really want to do in the future and in the next iteration of the Sourcing Hub is to make that generic information available to people who are sourcing any commodity. And that's something we're certainly working on now. You, you could use the information that's up there and pull it out for yourself right now but in the future we hope to make that much more available to people. Fantastic. Um, so I see there's a few other questions come in. Um, I think we have to leave it here. 
at 11.30, but as promised, we will make sure we review all the questions and make sure we've answered them properly, and we'll follow up with the slides, a recording to the, the webinar, and a summary of all the questions and our answers to those questions. We'll follow up in a, with an email with all of that information. Um, so just to, to conclude, I'd just like to say thank you so much for um, joining us for this webinar. And please don't stop asking your questions. Um, we're, as Alex mentioned, we're really keen on getting input and feedback from from you, so please do stay in touch and, and email us, call us with any questions, comments mm. that you might have. So thank you everyone for joining us, it's been, it's been great to have you.